Hi, this is Dave Johnson. Now, there's a lot of information out there about different light sources you can use inside greenhouses or inside indoor grow rooms and grow chambers. However, there's not a lot of information out there about how to actually measure the output from these light sources. How can we ensure that you're getting both the proper quality and quantity of light that your vegetation needs? How do we know how much light is coming out from these various light sources? And how do we know how much light is actually hitting the plants where you need it? So without measuring the output from these light sources, you're sort of on autopilot, which is almost like driving around a car without a speedometer. So in this video, what we're going to do is look at the actual light plants use for photosynthesis. We'll look at various sensor types and how they measure light. And then we'll go out and take some actual measurements under typical lights used in greenhouses and in grow chambers. And so whether you're growing vegetables, flowers, or cannabis, what you want to do is make sure you're getting proper measurements of light. And this will affect your lighting strategies to make sure you're not under or over lighting your plants. Okay, so let's first start talking about the difference between radiation waves and light waves, as there are sensors out there that can measure both of these. Now, let's begin with the electromagnetic spectrum. Up here at the top, we have our shorter, higher energy waves, for example, x-rays and gamma rays. And down at the bottom here, we have our longer, lower energy waves. For example, in this region right here are where the radio and television waves exist. But what we're interested in is this area here. This is where the solar energy from the sun is. And here you can see a solar irradiance curve. Now within this is a small band of radiation waves that the human eye can see. And the wavelengths in this range are just several hundreds of nanometers. And each color here has a different wavelength. For example, red is slightly longer at 700 nanometers, while the blue is at about 400 nanometers. So let's talk about how plants absorb this light energy and convert that into sugar that plants use for food. And we start here with a diurnal curve that was made outside. Across the x-axis, we have time of day, on the y-axis, we have CO2 assimilation, also known as photosynthesis. Now, the main purpose of this plot is to illustrate how energy from the sun is used to synthesize the CO2 and water into the building blocks that plants use for growth. Now, we can take a more detailed cellular level look inside a leaf, and you can see these chloroplasts. And inside the chloroplasts is a fairly complicated photochemical process. And we can change that to look at a more simplified view here and how the light is used in this process. Now inside these chloroplasts are various protein pigments. And each of these pigments have different functions. And in addition, each of these pigments best absorb specific wavelengths of light. So for example, if we look at chlorophyll B, we see that it best absorbs lights that have wavelengths of about 453 nanometers. Well, another pigment, phytochrome PFR, best absorb light that has a wavelength of about 730 nanometers. Now, in all, there's about 10 to 15 different uh, leaf pigments, and these can be put into three groups. One, which is primarily used for photosynthetic activity, a second for photomorphogenesis, and a third is more used for the photosynthetic process inside algae. So let's focus in on that photosynthetic group of pigments. Back in the late 1960s, early 1970s, Dr. Keith McCree and his colleagues at Texas A&M University put together a special apparatus that could measure the photosynthetic efficiency of leaves when exposed to specific wavelengths of light. Uh, they did this over 25 nanometer increments of light and across 22 different species of leaves. And you can see, for example, the results here for sorghum. Now, as expected, the photosynthetic activity occurred over the wavelengths where those five pigments best absorb light. Now, as you can see, those pigments and that photosynthetic activity primarily occurs between 400 and 700 nanometers. And so that's where the terminology photosynthetic active radiation, or PAR, came from. Now, ideally, what we want to do is measure the light that's falling within this PAR wave band, no matter whatever source is being used. So back in the early 1970s, at that same time, Lycor manufactured the first PAR sensor. And this PAR sensor could be used to measure the photosynthetic light that fell between these 400 and 700 nanometer wavelengths. So how do plants respond to the intensity of light within this PAR wave band? 
If we look at this light response curve here, we can see that as the photosynthetic active radiation increases, we have an increase in photosynthetic process. Now this starts off almost linear, but then kind of plateaus off. Some of the other factors that affect the shape of this curve are temperature, CO2 levels, and VPD. So how do we determine what the light intensity is from anything like the sun to the artificial lights used in greenhouses? Now artificial lamps and their manufacturers have specifications, but it's not always a true indication of what the actual light intensity is at your plant level. That's determined by things like the height between the light source and the plants. Also, whether that light source is directly overhead or at an angle. And also, the spectral composition or spectral quality of that light is going to have an effect. Now remember, we're trying to measure the amount of photons that are falling between 400 and 700 nanometers. So to do this, we want to measure with a light sensor. Now let's talk about the light sensor and the different design considerations that are made to make sure you're not getting errors in this light intensity measurement. Okay, so here's a light sensor. This particular model is a PAR sensor measuring the photosynthetic active radiation wave bands, also known as a quantum sensor. It's a self-powered device in which the light enters this diffuser at the top, passes through the body in a filter until it reaches a photodiode detector here at the base. Now, depending on the light intensity, that generates a microamp signal that travels through the cable to a readout device. Now you notice the top of the sensor here is engineered flat across rather than a rounded top, and that's to take care of what we call the cosine correction. Now the cosine correction makes sure that whenever the light is knocked directly overhead and at some angle, that the light is not being reflected or refracted to create an underestimation or an overestimation of what the light intensity is. You also notice on this sensor body that there's some slots here. That allows for water to drain out in case you're using this particular sensor outside or in an irrigated greenhouse. So now let's take a look at the anatomy of the sensor by looking at a schematic of what goes on inside the sensor body itself. So here's a cross section of that PAR sensor and this light enters in through the eye and passes through that specialized filter down to the photodiode. Now one of the more integral components of this sensor is that filter and that eliminates any of the light in the UV and far red ranges which does not have a direct effect on the photosynthetic measurement. This also goes to help standardize the PAR intensity from whichever light source you're using, whether it's a halogen, a red or blue LED, or the sun. You're gonna get the same response across that 400 to 700 nanometer range. So as we discussed earlier, people have different reasons for measuring light intensity. Some are interested in measuring the solar energy in units of watts per meter squared, Others are interested in measuring what the human eye sees in units of lux, and others are interested in uh, measuring what plants require for photosynthesis in units of micromoles per meter squared per second. So to do these functions, sensors are specifically engineered and designed to give the output that you want. For example, this is a pyranometer. This is used to measure the solar energy. Uh, there's a blue enhanced photodiode, but there's no filter, so all the light in the range from 400 nanometers all the way up to 1100 nanometers uh, is measured. And that includes that PAR wave band plus a far red wave band and beyond. Now this is the photometric sensor that's popular for measuring in units of lux. Uh, it also has that same photodiode. However, there's an engineered filter set that forms that bell-shaped curve with the peak at around 555 nanometers. But then as you approach the longer red wavelengths, those get filtered down and also filtering down as you move towards the, the uh, shorter blue wavelengths as well. And we talked about the quantum sensor or the PAR sensor, which has that filter with very sharp cutoffs but between 400 and 700 nanometers. And that's to ensure that we get equal light intensity measurements uh, no matter what the light source is within that PAR waveband but it also eliminates any light from the UV range below 400 or in the far red range above 700 nanometers. Okay, so a common question we get is if I have a photometric sensor that's measuring in units of lux or a pyranometer that's measuring uh, solar energy in watts per meter squared, can I simply take that measurement and do a conversion and get units of micromoles per meter squared per second? So uh, the answer is not very easily. 
And that's because, as we just discussed, the output of each of these sensors is shaped by the filters inside. And so that depends on also the spectral composition of the light source. So what fraction of red, green, and blue light is coming from the source? For example, if you have the sun or an incandescent light, a metal halide or an LED, each of those are gonna give uh, different spectral composition outputs. Now each sensor might give a different result for the same light source. Now in addition, uh, certain light sources, for example, the sun or incandescent lights, uh, have uh, solar energy and light up above 700 nanometers, for example. So this pyranometer will measure it while the others won't, making that conversion more difficult. If you really wanted to do the conversion, what you need to know is the spectral output and the intensity of the light at each wavelength between 400 and 700, and then you can integrate and do that conversion. But what we can do is go out and do an experiment using these three sensors under a variety of light sources, including the sunlight, and also under artificial lamps that are used in greenhouses. And what we'll do is we'll take all the uh, results and convert and normalize them on micromoles per meter squared per second and see how they measure differently. Uh, one thing to note is this photometric sensor can also be a, um, act as a proxy for maybe a lower quality PAR sensor uh, that was designed where it has a filter that doesn't have very sharp cutoffs or that the filter cutoffs are in the wrong location. So let's go on out and make some measurements and see what kind of results we get. Okay, so we're gonna do our first set of measurements out here in the sunlight. I have our three sensors on that mounting plate uh, with bubble levels here so we can make sure the sensors are level when we make the measurements. And the signal again is transported to a, a logging device. This is an LI-1500. Uh, which I can make instantaneous measurements with, or I can set it up to make automated measurements at a given time interval. So we can do a couple measurements while we're outside here. We can do some in indirect sunlight. The sun is at an angle. I can level the sensors and record that measurement. I can also do direct measurements of sunlight by angling these directly at the sun. So they're perpendicular, make a measurement. And then also we can do diffuse measurements. We can have diffuse sunlight, for example, if vegetation is overhead casting shadows, either inside or outside a greenhouse. We could also have structures in the greenhouse that cause shadows or potentially shelving. Another thing to think about, kind of like Groundhog Day, is where you cast your shadow. You want to make sure you're not uh, blocking any of the light that you're trying to measure while making the measurement itself. And then sometimes, now for those of you in greenhouses, you're gonna have cloudy and overcast days like the one you see here today. And you may need to make some decisions on if you have to apply supplemental lighting to meet your daily light integral goals. Or you might be at a critical stage where you need to inhibit or stimulate flowering. If you can measure the light intensity in your greenhouse, that'll help you make those decisions. Let's now take a look at how those three different sensors measure the intensity of light in the PAR wave band coming from the sun. And this colorful plot here, this is generated by an instrument called the spectrometer. And we're gonna talk a lot more about it in our second follow-up video. But as we saw earlier, the sun has a wide spectral output that goes down below 380 and up above 780 nanometers. In this particular plot, we're looking at the relative photon flux density at each particular wavelength. Now let's focus in again on the PAR wave band that goes from 400 to 700 nanometers, where all the photosynthetic activity is taking place. And we'll notice that the sun obviously has the solar light energy outside of this PAR wave band. And now let's take a look at how that affects the measurements made by these three different sensors. So in this next plot here, we're gonna look at the photosynthetic photon flux density in that wave band. And this first blue bar is made by the PAR sensor. This second yellow bar is made by the sensor with the slightly incorrect filters. And this third, red bar here is the measurement made by the sensor without any filters. And you can notice there's a huge overestimation with this sensor. And why is that? If we look back at the spectral output here, you can see how much light energy there is up above 700 nanometers. Since the sensor doesn't have any filters, it's gonna read in all that light energy and attribute it to the measurement. That's why we don't wanna use this type of sensor for measuring the sun for PAR or for lights inside the greenhouse. So here we are outside a glass greenhouse. We're gonna go inside and make some measurements of the lights. Uh, since we're not in an indoor grow room, we've had to wait for the sun to go down so we can measure the output from the lights alone rather than having it be affected by the sunlight. 
let's go on inside and make some measurements. So here we are in the greenhouse. The first set of measurements we're going to do here is on an LED light fixture from Fluids. Okay, so we have those same three sensors that we were using outdoors. But now we're going to see how they measure the intensity from a light into here in the greenhouse. So we don't want to hold it up close to the light. We want to take the measurement down here at the leaf level. Okay, so to take the measurement, I make this even with the top of the canopy. I check the bubble levels to make sure everything's straight and take a measurement. I can do two other interesting measurements. I can put this down here and get a measurement below the canopy to let me know how much light's reaching down here and if I need to space the plants differently. A second interesting measurement is to stick it underneath leaves and see how much light is transmitting down from the upper canopy to the lower canopy through the leaves. So let's look at the spectral output from this LED and compare it to the spectral output from the sun. So here again is the plot of the sunlight, and here's a plot of the spectral output from the Fluence LED. Now we'll go ahead and draw boxes around the PAR wave bands that we're interested in. Some of the key differences between these two sources is there's this peak of blue light in the LED, there's a small valley between the blue and the green transition, and there's a lot less far red uh, light from this particular light source. So the next question to ask is how will these three different light sensors measure the light intensity from this particular light source. So here's a plot of the photosynthetic photon flux density, and we see our PAR sensors measuring at about 1,000. Now if we look at the sensor with the slightly incorrect filters, we notice it's overestimating the amount by about 10%, most likely due to this proportion of green and red light. Now if we look at the sensor that doesn't have any filters, we notice it's down about 10%, most likely due to the reduction in the red and far red light that this sensor typically sees when it's calibrated in the sunlight. So this is the next lamp fixture we're going to measure output from. It's an LED from Philips, primarily red and blue. And we're going to now measure the output from this one. Okay, we have some pots with seedlings. You can see some plants emerging here. This is under the Philips red and blue LED lamp. And we want to see if these three different sensors measure the intensity differently under this particular fixture. So this particular LED has an interesting spectral response with a peak in the red at about 655, a little bit of blue light as well. So how will our three sensors measure the intensity of PAR from this particular light source? So if we look at our photosynthetic photon flux density chart, we can see our PAR sensors measuring just over 250. However, if we look at the sensor with the slightly incorrect filters, we see a huge error of almost 80% underestimation, most likely due to the lack of green light from this light source, even though there's red and blue LEDs in that PAR waveband. Now if we look at the uh, sensor without filters, we notice there's also a slight underestimation, again probably due to the lack of far red light. So here we have one more LED fixture, this is from Vipar. And again, we're going to check to see how the three sensors measure the output intensity from this particular light source. And just like we've done with the other LED fixtures, we take the measurements underneath the light source at canopy level, and let's see how these three measure that intensity. So here's the spectral output from that Vipar LED, and here's the PAR chart. We can see that our PAR sensor is measuring at about 350. Now if we look at the sensor with the incorrect or low quality filters, we can see that this is underestimating by about 34%. Most likely that can be attributed to the lack of green from this particular LED. If we look at the sensor that doesn't have any filters in it, we can see this is also underestimating by about 30%, and this could probably be attributed to the lack of red and far red light from this LED. Now where we can get into trouble is if we use either of these two sensors to control our lights, and we're gonna end up trying to crank up our light source and we're gonna either burn through energy or burn our vegetation. So let's go ahead and look at one more light source, this time a metal halide. Okay, so for this next test, we have an environmental chamber here with a couple of high intensity discharge 
lamps. They actually have a 1200 watt metal halide bulb, which is quite common in the used in greenhouses. And we're going to put our sensors in here and see how they react and measure to those. Okay, so we powered on that metal halide bulb inside this chamber. Here's the light bulb source. And down here we have our three different sensors. And we're going to do a comparison to see how each of them measured the light intensity from this same source. So here's the spectral output from that metal halide light source. And here is the PAR chart. We can see that the PAR sensor was measuring 750. And the sensor with the incorrect filters was only about 15% off, most likely due to the green peaks from this light source. However, if we look at the sensor that doesn't use any filters, we see there's a huge overestimation, over 80%. That's going to be attributed to this far red light that's being read in by that sensor and being incorrectly reported as PAR. So this is an eye-opening chart that shows a substantial percent error in trying to measure the light that plants require for photosynthesis using a sensor that either has incorrect filtering or no filtering at all. And it varies depending on what light source you're using. Now let's assume that you can get some sort of a sensor that has filtering in it. Now if that doesn't have a high quality filter in there, you're still going to end up with errors in your PAR measurement, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. And again, it varies per light source. So to avoid having adverse effects on your lighting strategy, make sure you have a sensor that has high quality filters. So let's summarize by discussing some of the repercussions of using an incorrect light measurement. In this light response plot, again, we can see how increasing our PAR has a direct relationship on increasing photosynthesis and yield. So let's take the example of being in a grow room where we have a light system that provides about 900 micromoles of light. That would create a photosynthetic rate of somewhere around 22. Now, if we're in that grow room and we have an inaccurate sensor and we're underestimating at about 400 micromoles, then we think our photosynthetic rate is somewhere around 16. So inadvertently, we might go and crank up the lights, or we might decrease the distance between the light source and the plants. Either one of those, we could potentially end up cooking the plants and or spending a lot more money on energy than we want to. Now on the flip side, let's say we have a grow room and we have a light system providing just under 500 micromoles of light. So our photosynthetic rate is somewhere around 16. Now the sensor we're using in this uh, application overestimates and it tells us we're having about a thousand micromoles of light so in the end we think we have a photosynthetic rate of somewhere around 24. So either we might turn down the lights to save energy or we might be happy with where everything is and we might just keep the light set and in that situation we're going to end up losing yield. Now let's take this situation into account where we have uh, micromoles of 1100 in the grow room and a photosynthetic rate of somewhere around 24, but we want to squeeze a little bit more out of the system. So we turn up the light, and in return, we see we also get an increase in yield. Now, however, we've increased our light by 20%, but our yield only went up by 4%. So we had a large change in light intensity, but a very small change in yield. So we want to make sure our sensors are measuring accurately and not just going off the specifications from the light manufacturer. So we've discussed several lights. There's a lot more out there. And the key to measuring light intensity accurately is to make sure we're measuring the correct wave bands of light in that PAR range. We also want to make sure that we have a sensor that can measure under a variety of different light sources as each of them have different spectrums. We also don't want to just go into autopilot mode. We want to make sure we're making measurements as these light sources age, the light intensity is going to change. In addition, we don't want to uh, make measurements just under the light, we want to make it at the plant level as the distance from the light sources and the angles of the light all play into the actual intensity of the measurement. So what do we have for solutions? Well, throughout the video, we've been featuring this LI-190R PAR sensor that's manufactured by Lycor. It very accurately measures the intensity of light and the photons that fall within that PAR wave band regardless of the light source, whether it's the sun or artificial lighting. With that, we can make some actionable decisions. For example, the kind of light sources we use, whether we want to increase or decrease lighting, change distance from lighting to the plants, or even how we play, uh, space plants out in the greenhouse. Now, something we didn't touch a lot on yet was the daily light integral. Now, this is the total amount of light received in a single day in a particular area.
It's actually the number of moles of photons per day. Now to get at that, it's not very easy from an instantaneous measurement because, especially in greenhouses, you have changing light conditions throughout the day. So what you will do is record the intensity of light at set timed intervals and then integrate under that area to get a final DLI value. Now to do this, you can record it on a device like the one shown here. This is the LI1500, which already has a program built into it to calculate this for you. So a few last words about Lycor and their PAR sensor. Lycor has been manufacturing these PAR sensors for almost 50 years. They're top of the line quality and considered the standard. In fact, it's what other sensor manufacturers often benchmark their sensors against. There's a staff of engineers, plant scientists, physiologists, all collaborating together to come up with these excellent solutions. And as we saw throughout the video, there's a very important relationship between the light intensity and the PAR waveband and the resulting success of your plant's growth. So in the end, can you afford not to measure the light intensity that your plants are exposed to? So that wraps up our first video where we talked about the importance of measuring the quantity or the intensity of the light plants use for photosynthesis and making sure you have an appropriate sensor that can accurately make those measurements. Now throughout the video, there were several plots that showed the spectral quality of light. And so in our next video, we're going to go ahead and show this instrument in action. It's a spectrometer and we're going to make some spectral measurements of both sunlight and artificial lights used in greenhouses.